We are live broadcasting Nerd's Interview with a Guru. This week, as with every week, we have a very special program planned for you. We have Babette, and please tell me if I pronounce this wrong, Papai, <laughs> is it? No, it's, it's close, it's Papai. Papai, okay. Babette Papai uh, from Bakespace.com with us, and we're going to talk, of course, about Bakespace.com. We're going, to, but Babette has some very interesting other experience. Also, founder of Tech Munch, traveling food blogger, conference built uh, thousands of food bloggers. She's built relationships with around the globe prior to launching Big Space. So, Babette, thank you so much for being with us, and I really appreciate you coming on. Let's start off the way we always do. Just tell us in a few words, you know, who you are, what you do, and whom you do it for. Sure. Um, uh, my name is Babette Pepai. I'm the founder and CEO of BakeSpace.com. Uh, we have three sort of components to our company. One is a community, which is BakeSpace.com, a food blogger conference called Tech Bunch, and then a cookbook publishing platform where anyone can publish their own cookbook called Cookbook Cafe. I uh, started producing reality television, had a really bad experience where I had to tell one mother to tell another mother that she was the worst mother in the world took a cake decorating class, and then I was hooked. Um, the food community embraced me, and uh, the rest is history. <laughs> gotcha. Now, you said so people can publish their own recipes, and are those recipes mm -hmm. sold, or they're made available to anybody who wants them? Well, you can, you can publish recipes just if you want to participate in the recipe swap in the community, but if you want to market your recipes and turn them into revenue, uh, we have a self-publishing platform called Cookbook Cafe, that enables anyone to publish both as an ebook and also as a native iPad app that lives within our storefront. So if someone's looking for chocolate chip cookie recipes, they may not know that they want your cookbook, but uh, because of the way it's indexed, they can easily find it. That's fantastic. And how did you get the idea to start this? I mean, wh wh where did you get your start with all this? Did you grow up cooking or I mean, we, 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 did you hang out in the kitchen with mom baking all the time? What, what, how did this all start? You know, I, I remember growing up that my, my, I come from half Italian, half Albanian family. So both are very in the kitchen, um, making all sorts of crazy recipes. Usually never a recipe. It's like you go into the kitchen, you see what you have, you come back out and you have a meal. Um, and my mom would always literally just look in the refrigerator and bring out something. So I, I never really grew up with in terms of, specific recipes, but I always appreciated um, people who were able to do that. And so when I took a cake decorating class for the first time, uh, I loved being a part of that community. Uh, it's a very uh, warm, friendly, they want to share. Uh, I had just come from television, which was a really competitive uh, environment. Of course, technology is also a competitive environment, so I, I'm sort of sticking with my roots, um, but warming it up a bit. Uh, and uh, I just, when, when social media started happening, I realized that um, it's not just about sharing and broadcasting, it's about also having a utility and, and giving something or learning something about somebody's past or culture. And so when I thought there really isn't anything that connects home cooks in real time, uh, I thought, you know, without any tech experience, I'll just make it. And, and we did. I learned a lot of lessons and what not to do. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, yeah, I'm sure that's an ongoing process. I know it is yeah. for me. Um, but that's fascinating. What a great idea. I mean, you know, bringing together the home cooks. I know that uh, just from what I see on the Food Channel, my wife loves the Food Channel. And, of course, food is a great uh, sort of doorway to walk through to get access into many cultures. So it's interesting what you said about that because it's true. It's, every culture has its own kind of food, I guess. You know, so that's interesting. And s since you mentioned it, and I know I grew up in a neighborhood that was all basically Italians, Jews, and Irish people, also big on food. Like you said, you're part Italian. I'm curious, though, what are some, uh, since you mentioned that you're also part Albanian, what are some traditional Albanian cuisines? This I have to know. <laughs> well, a lot of lamb, which is hilarious because I'm a vegetarian. So uh, you'll see a lamb on a spit going around in circles. Uh, <laughs> you'll see a lot of vegetables. It's very Greek um, mm -hmm. by base, by just... The, the, most of the things that you'll find in the Greek culture, you'll also find in the Albanian culture as well. Um, a ton of vegetables. Uh, there's some stuff called petala, which is like a, like a fried donut. That's not really a donut, and you dip it in honey. That's delicious. Um, 
there's a ton of feta. Anything that is an Albanian recipe has feta in it in some capacity. In fact, right. I was in Michigan recently, and we saw part of my Albanian family, and I text them with just the message, I must come over and get feta. <laughs> I was like, I'm in town. I'm coming over. Please feed me. So uh, I would say, uh, you know, when you, if you were to go to an Albanian house, there would be a block of feta on a plate, tons of the peppers. There'd be a cucumber and tomato salad with onions. Um, and people would just help themselves. It's a very, even the way that they eat is very uh, family oriented. It's not, I give you a plate and I give you a plate and I give you a plate. It's, there's one big plate on the table and everyone is picking whatever they want. Um, and lots, lots of watermelon. <laughs> okay, interesting. The watermelon is an interesting one. So that's, that's great. And just, so going back to kind of the big picture, bake space. So did you ever go to culinary school or this is just strictly just from yeah. your experience at home? You know, I, I think the key was that when I took the cake decorating class, I wanted to connect with other home cooks. And in 2006, there really wasn't anything online. I mean, there was, you had forums, you had, um, I mean, forums were basically where people were actually communicating at that time. Sure, there was Facebook, sure, there was MySpace. But MySpace was so big, you couldn't even find anyone that you had something in common with. You just literally stumbled upon people over people over people. Um, and there were so many blinky and shiny and glittery things that you, <laughs> you know, sometimes couldn't get past that. Um, and so I, you know, and Facebook was closed. It was for college kids. So I thought, well, if I can uh, make it so that a profile was a kitchen and that people would swap recipes anytime you would upload a recipe, your friends would automatically be fed that recipe. Um, we, that works really well for branded content that we do. Um, but uh, I realized there wasn't anything like that online that would just update people in real time. Mm. So uh, I spent my like 5,000 bucks, <laughs> and I was just like, I'm just going to go throw caution to the wind. But of course, you can't start a website for $5,000 and expect it to stay up. <laughs> but, but somehow, somehow it did. It did. It, 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 uh, and the people came. It was really fun. It was actually, that's what was the best part of social media and any site that you build is you put it out there, and when the community starts to come, they actually make it their own, and you, you almost have to step back a bit and let them play with it and see what breaks and, um, and then see what elements that they start using, which I think is a good lesson in business sometimes where it's like you can't be too set on what your original intention was. You have to kind of let them play with it a bit. Yes, Apple Computer, I think, is a prime example of that, you know, where they go out and they don't really sell products. They build a community around something that people are passionate about, and then they let the people kind of drive, you know, what they produce. And yeah. I think you, I, I agree with you 100%. It sounds like for somebody who went into this knowing nothing about tech, you know, it sounds like you've learned a ton, and I'm guessing you yeah. would have to by force of need. But I, I agree with you. The, you know, the whole objective when you're building a community is to create something that's bigger than you. You know, yeah. that, I think when you realize that you've done that, that's when you know you've succeeded, you know. And I think when you know that's happened is when you, when you get to that point where you realize, okay, let me step back. Let me let this become organic and see where it goes and, you know, like hands off. I, I, I planted the seed. I, I yeah. poured the water on it. Now it's growing. Let me see what I get. <laughs> you just hope you don't mess it up. <laughs> so, it, well, and sometimes that's the best reason to stay hands off, you know, stay out of it and just monitor and engage, yeah. you know, where you need to. Obviously, there ha always has to be some engagement, you know, as the uh, sort of uh, center of that community. Well, I think, I think the key for customer support, which is a good lesson for this too, is when you're when you're setting the tone for how something needs to be, you almost have to be a, a tad bit firm with what the rules of the road are, but you have to allow people to be able to communicate back to you. So I think in, in any customer support, you, if, if you let things go, people will just start to walk all over the site They'll just, or the community. They'll just start to post stuff that's not appropriate. Um, so if you kind of set the tone, once the other community members start to um, invest in it, they will then know the tone, and they won't let people start doing that too, which is really the key to a successful community is just creating that first sort of base of people who are going to help you manage that because it just gets too big that you can't, you can't do it on your own. Right, right. Yeah, and I think you're right. You, you, well, you, when you build the culture, then, yeah, they're going to yeah. kind of enforce it just as a naturally organic process. They're going to enforce whatever the culture is. Um, my, fa my favorite member is Martha, who 
emails me every day. If there is a recipe that is not appropriate, <laughs> she will say this is not a recipe. I mean, she okay, is like my eyes and ears. <laughs> I have to ask them, so what constitutes an inappropriate recipe? Uh, usually if it's not a recipe, <laughs> if it's something spam, like the other day we had um, buying ebooks or something like that. It was like, if you want to buy I ebooks... See, okay. They'll, they'll u what, what spammers will do is they'll come and they'll utilize a recipe because it gets syndicated out through the community and it gets it's indexed well in Google. They'll use that page and self-publishing as a way to kind of spread the message. I see. I see. I thought you were maybe referring to like inappropriate ingredients. In oh, the no. <laughs> no. Usually if you're going to go through the trouble of writing a recipe, it's probably okay. Well, there, I, we know there are recipes out there that uh, involve the use of, you know, illegal substances. Oh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's what I was kind of thinking. Somebody, um, somebody actually said one time, they're like, "Is it baked space?" <laughs> oh, oh, that's funny. <laughs> yeah, and for 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 um, uh, April Fools' one year, we actually posted, we changed our URL of our blog to baked space. And we said that we were going to, because of the economy, we had to find a way to make sure that we would survive. So we were got now going to be a, you know, a weed recipe site. It was hysterical. <laughs> it was like the funniest thing ever. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you got some very interesting uh, action on that. It's, yeah. you know, it's funny. I, I, as long as we're on the topic, I'll share a funny story. I use a service, and I tout it very much, called Shoebox.com. Oh, nice. It's a service where you can send in your receipts, and they scan everything, your bills, even your business cards. And they have a blog, and they have a really cool customer service department. And on their blog, they'll share some funny stories about some of the things that it seems probably have slipped into the envelopes that people sent in, because you get these sort of you know pre-made envelopes to send your receipts in. And they've gotten, like, car keys and things. And this one blog post explained how, you know, it was talking about this and how they get some really interesting stuff. And in one case, evidently, they had gotten a bag of somebody's medical marijuana. And they said that in most cases they return whatever has been sent, but for obvious legal reasons they were not able to return this. They didn't mention the person by name, of course, but they just said, in case you happen to get this, we're very sorry. <laughs> That's great. That's really so, hysterical. Oh, my God. Funny. So now I want to touch on a couple of things that you touched on. Okay. First of all... Um, you talked about uh, building a website for $5,000. Have you experienced at this point, uh, let, me, let, me, let me go out on a limb and I'll put something out there and feel free to disagree with me. In my experience so far, you can actually build a website and a significant presence for very little cost. I don't think you even need $5,000. No, I think $1, not now. What do you, yeah, so, so tell me about that. No, I think with WordPress, and using templates and using themes, uh, you can build a website for like, uh, gosh, I would say, I don't know, the cost of the domain, uh, maybe a WordPress template, uh, which is maybe 50 bucks, maybe 100 bucks if you want. And you, can you can customize these things now like you wouldn't believe. Um, and then maybe getting a designer to come in and just like tweak things to make it personalized. But you can usually find a WordPress theme for any industry. Like for 50 bucks. I mean, it's, it's insane. I mean, yes. to do a, a whole community, I mean, there is BuddyPress, which is off of WordPress. Uh, you do need someone to, to know how to work that. It's not easy just to putting the community together. There are things like Ning, which is a community-driven site um, that you can, you know, it's like self-publishing to a community site. Um, there are things like that. We wanted, to, we wanted to own the content, and we wanted to make sure that we owned um, not only uh, the technology behind the website, so that took us a little bit longer. And in 2006, it was very different. There wasn't any, like, off... There were off-the-shelf stuff, but they weren't that good. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. now it's totally different. Every time I hear somebody say, like, oh, I have to, like, make a, a, a website and I need to hire a designer, I'm like, do not do that. Get a WordPress, just get a template, get something that's really fun. You're going to change it in six months anyway. Just get your website up. Yeah, and that's the key, and I think you actually have to keep changing or at least adding yeah. to it and building on it. So uh, also I want to jump back to something else you touched on. I know you, 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 you were in um, television publishing. Was the type of publishing you were in related to the food industry, or what was, what no. was that experience about? No, I did, uh, I produced reality television, so I did, I started at The Real World. I did Road Rules, and then the oh, show wow. The shows kept getting progressively worse, but the money kept getting better. <laughs> That's how you can tell about reality television. It's like, it doesn't have to be a good show, but it, it, it pays really well. Um, 
And my last show was a spinoff of Wife Swap called Vacation Swap, where we, my last, I remember like the last few days of shooting, and I had to get one mother to tell another mother that she was the worst mother in the world. And I was like, wow, I think I've, I think I've crossed the line. Like I, I mean, I, she could look at me. We we looked at each other, and she just knew we were both just. This was just for the camera, mm -hmm. and she she could tell that my eyes were like, I'm so sorry, but please, you know, say what I need you to say. Um, and that was the worst part because you know you look at me, I look friendly, I look nice, like I can probably get you to say anything, <laughs> which is terrible. Um, so at that <laughs> time, I was like, I'm going to hell. I gotta save myself. Bring me back <laughs> from the dark side. Um, so cake decorating, that's sort of where I went. But what, pup, what producing did, though, is um, it taught me about customer service because when, you're, when you have a shoot and you need to get something out there, you have to do whatever you can to make sure that the shoot doesn't get shut down. So that means dealing with neighbors. That means dealing with locations. That means dealing with vendors. That means dealing with your cast who uh, has expectations that, you know, maybe they think that this is going to be a, a push into their music career, um, but you just need to get through the show. Uh, it taught me that. It taught me um, how to work with brands because it, your content that you have is not necessarily the, the only goal. The goal is also if you want to make money, how do you make your brands happy? Um, taught me about that uh, and pr pr I guess persistence because with a television show, you just have to keep going until the show is over. You just can't, it's not like a 9 to 5 thing. You have to go at 110%. So. Okay, so let's talk about that because then at some point you left television production and you went into the social media tech slash blogosphere slash let's get a website up <laughs> and let's build a community and I'm sure you didn't have all that in mind when you started but probably some of it, you at least had some idea that you were going to do something having to do with cooking and baking and you wanted to, you were hoping that people would come and follow and get involved and build a community, right? Yes. That's so exactly. what did that look like? How did you actually start out? Uh, I would say PR. <laughs> I would say a publicist is your best friend. Um, we, yeah, no, everyone says the press release is dead. The press release is not dead. Um, if you, you can build something amazing, if nobody knows about it, it it's like, what's the point? Um, we, we built the community, and then we immediately put out our release, and we immediately started... Um, this was in 2006. It was much easier to get in Mashable and TechCrunch. It was much easier to get someone to write about you. There were a ton of food sections that were available. Now a lot of the newspapers don't have food sections. So um, the, the opportunity has definitely been narrowed down. Um, so and we were the first. Uh, we, it was, it's a funny story. We, the Chow.com was launching. This is a great uh, lesson in don't be afraid of competition, too, because... <laughs> Chow.com was launching the following Wednesday, and the Friday before, they had been in the New York Times. Giant article, here I am, like, you know, working away, thinking, you know, I'm going to, like, make this great website, and all of a sudden, I see the New York Times, and it's like, food community with social, whatever, and I'm like, oh, no, they have money, and they have access, and they just have so much. What the hell am I going to do? Um, and what we did was, uh, I basically came out of my bedroom and I was like, I told my boyfriend, I said, you know what, uh, they, we may not be the best, but we will be first because no one can take that away from you. So I said, we are going to launch on Tuesday. <laughs> and that actually helped really well because what we did was, I, what you have to realize is when there are these big companies that are putting out their release and they are meeting, they are talking to every single reporter, they are trying to explain to people this new technology and this new sort of social sharing you have very little work to do when you send them your release because now they see a trend. Now they see, oh, there's something happening here. There's more than one site being created. There must be something going on here. They understand it because Chow spent the entire time like kind of uh, greasing the wheels a bit. I don't know if that's the right term. That, I meant that in the best possible way. <laughs> I understand. I, I love them. They're really great, actually. Um, and so by the time we came out, now it's a trend. Now, of course, every single paper is going to include us in their, 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 their articles. So um, Jane Goldman, who's actually the editor of Chow.com, uh, several years later, about a year ago, actually, we were, she was speaking at my conference, and I was like, Jane, you don't realize we have such a good relationship that it started in 2006. And she's like, what? And I told her that. I'm like, you were instrumental in helping us get PR, helping us be where we're at. 
So she was she was pretty shocked. But you should definitely not be afraid of competition. There's a, there's enough room for everybody. It's just you don't want to be the last. That that's right. really the key. Well, yeah, it's interesting. I assume, especially because you've gotten involved with social media, that you've probably uh, encountered Gary Vaynerchuk. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In your yeah. He, in his book Crush It, speaks about how. It doesn't matter if there's somebody who's got more money than you out there trying to do the same thing. What really matters at the end is who works harder. Whoever works harder is the one who's going to win. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's kind of his message, and I love yeah. that because it lets me know and it reminds me, and I've read the book twice now, and the second time was kind of recently. I was on the plane flying to, across the country, and I, I was like, you know, it's a short, easy read. I'm just going to grab this and read it again on the way, and I'm glad I did because it sort of it re-energized me. You know? yeah. And he says that. He, you don't, yeah. You don't have to worry about having money. You don't need money to build a business these days. The Internet has leveled the playing field. I mean, would you say that's true in your experience, that the Internet has completely leveled the playing field? Definitely. No, I think your ability to um, make a mark, make a dent, uh, build a brand is exponentially possible now. Um, I think that uh, the, the key is really to be genuine in, in the process and how you do it. Uh, people will... So they'll they be if you're if you're if your goal is to just like make a whole bunch of money and like build this brand and get a whole bunch of Twitter followers or whatever, it's usually pretty transparent and people will follow you if they feel that there's a genuine person on the other end. Um, it's sort of they get weeded out pretty quickly. Um, but uh, no, I think that the the that has democratized brand building the internet. Okay, so you started a business based on a passion you had. Right, you started. I shouldn't even say. I don't even like to say started a business. You started a community based on a passion you had. Obviously, I'm assuming by now it's producing revenue. It's successful. So think back to when you started out, and now you've got more people than ever, you know, who are out there trying now to do what you did back in 2006 when you started. What do you say to those people? What's your, you know, what's what's your advice for them? What what should they do? How should they start? Where should they start? I think they should um, find what makes them genuinely unique. Um, you don't need to have 100 million users to have a successful business. In fact, if, you're, if the demographic that your website or your community or your brand attracts, if that's important to somebody, they will pay to access those people. Even if it's 20 people, they will pay if it's the top of the line or the top of the class or whatever it is that they're trying to reach. Um, so don't be discouraged. I mean, everyone, you know, I get discouraged sometimes when it's like Facebook has like a billion this and a billion that. I'm like, oh, my God, a billion. <laughs> How am I going to even compete on that level? But, you know, if you have the right demographic for that particular brand, the key is is aligning yourself with brands who will attract the same kinds of brands. So when you first do your first partnerships, don't do a partnership with just something that's going to give you a couple hundred bucks and that's really crappy. Do it with, even if it's for free, do it with the top of the class of that, um, that type of company because they will attract more like that. And that's, I think, really the key with a lot of people is they, they assume that they have to make, you know, whatever is worth it is they have to make the money right now. And, and sometimes with technology companies, the value is building something and a lot of the time your value comes at the end when you cash out, when you get acquired, when you get absorbed into a bigger company that makes it even more successful. So you're constantly building something. So don't be afraid to look at the short term. I mean, don't be afraid to look at the long term. Try not to look at just the short term uh, advantages um, and try to create partnerships where those things will just, they will keep paying in spades over and over and over again um, if you build it with the right with the right teams. Okay, and um, uh, top branding tips. I mean, you talked about branding a couple of times already. Uh, give me your top branding tips. What should people know about branding? God, what should people know about branding? <laughs> That's like an open-ended question. I don't I, know. I didn't that on purpose. You want me to get more specific? <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I can bite into. <laughs> so I, I want to. Everybody wants to build a brand. First of all, help me understand what 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 what's the difference between branding and and just marketing. Well, I think branding is something where it's identifiable. It's you. Like you, if you see the Nike swoosh, like that's 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 branding. Marketing is really telling people about your brand. That's my opinion. So Fair I enough. think it's it's key to have the right message, it's key to have something that's identifiable. Like we have a cupcake in our logo and we have been told by so many people they 
they, everyone thinks we're just a baking site because of the logo, because it has a cupcake in it, but it has like 60,000 recipes that are all different types of recipes. But because we have the cupcake in the logo, it makes it more distinctive at the time when we originally did the redesign in 2008. So we, we kind of haven't really um, moved from it just because we're afraid that if we do, some of the original members just won't even recognize what the brand is. Um, so it kind of, be careful what brand you commit to. <laughs> right. No, that's funny because I, uh, you know, my, my profile picture ended up being what it is because it started to get recognized and uh -huh. it had switched over. I had a logo, you know, like a, it was yeah. sort of a cartoon caricature of me. And I started putting up on a few of the social sites a picture of me with one of my dogs. I have three dogs. And what happened was, I don't know if you ever heard of Empire Avenue? Uh-huh, Yeah. Empire Avenue is a site that not a lot of people seem to know about, but people who are entrenched in social media definitely know about it. And I had the logo still on that site, and somebody sold my shares, somebody who I know well. And I reached out to him, and I said, hey, what was that all about? Why'd you sell my shares? You know, like, I didn't yeah. really care. I didn't take it personally. But, and, but the interesting thing was what resulted was he got back to me and says, I didn't recognize your picture. He, oh, he uh -huh. says, your profile picture is you and the dog on every other site I've seen, and I didn't recognize it. And that made, I learned something very important about branding right there, right? You know, yeah. just the profile picture should be consistent because that's how people are going to recognize you. And that, yeah. to me, I, I think that's the key about, you know, what branding is really all about. It's about making sure that people recognize you wherever they go. And so this will lead us into my next question about well, branding. But, but, but before you move into that, I wanted to say something else about the profile picture is, for my profile on Twitter, I used to have our, um, it was like a picture of an art gallery with a cupcake as like the big picture of art with two women like looking at it, right? But I had that for a very long time. And I realized that people, I, I had my, my personal picture first and people were talking to me. I changed it to that one that was more generic because I thought, oh, I'm going to do more, mostly just the bake space stuff and I'll actually move. I have a personal account called Bad Cupcake, which is like my alter ego. Um, and I was like, oh, I'll move it over there, which of course I never have time to do my personal stuff. But when I changed it, people did not talk to me at all on Twitter. Like, I would send out a great tweet, and I would talk to people. Nobody would talk to me if they didn't recognize a face. And I realized at that time, I was like, whoa, Twitter is very different. Like, if you really are a person behind your brand, you have to have your picture as opposed to just the logo because people just don't, they don't, they don't get it. They just don't think you're real, and they think you're just a box. So I, I yeah. agree with you on that a lot. Yeah, I, and I agree that it should be, unless you're like Coca-Cola, yeah. you know, or some huge company, then your social media, you know, your Twitter, your Facebook should have your face. I yeah, agree. With I agree. You there. Um, and, and speaking of Twitter, you, you have a ton of followers. So tell us, how did you ultimately build that Twitter following? Was it just organic because you had a topic that you were talking about that a lot of people were passionate about? Or is there anything you can share with us specifically that you did to build that following? I think um, with, I use Zite a lot. I don't know if you know that app. Tell us what you know that is because I might, but everybody else might not. Oh, Zite is a great app. Basically what it does is um, it's kind of like Flipboard, but it curates content on topics, not by what your friends post. So I'll so put in like the, go ahead. I'm sorry, just if you don't mind, on the left-hand side, put in the chat so we can share it publicly, oh, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the URL for it, because this sounds like a oh. great tool that people need to know about. I don't know. If, I don't know if it has a URL. <laughs> I think it's probably site dot com. But I I use it in the app. Let me see if I can get my. Okay, let's see. Site. Zite Z I T. Yeah. I say site dot com. I think it's like for me. It's my it's my favorite. Um, well, besides my own app, um, it's my favorite app because it 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 curates the best content that most people have shared or something that's just by topic, like for me, you know, I have publishing and I have baking and cupcakes and like things, depending on like what I'm in the mood to tweet out, and it will curate that content for me so that all I have to do is just kind of go through the best picks, hit share, and, and tweet it out. And um, that's been very successful in, in kind of streamlining that process of like finding good content to share. I always forget to share my own links to my own website, which is embarrassing. Um, <laughs> I'm always like, oh, I should tweet something about Big Space. Um, and then we've had a lot of press uh, from uh, launching of our cookbook publishing platform recently. We just got in a big 
uh, magazine in, in uh, Canada. And then uh, LA Times did a big thing on us. And then also um, uh, the conferences. So I have, a, you know, like 5,000 food bloggers that I, you know, meet per year. Um, so when we're actually during the conference, we do contests and we say, like, follow Big Space and... I chat, I tweet things like that are happening during the conference. So I think by creating a hashtag that people are following, depending on you know at the time we do like eight events a year, um, that just it 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 helps with that. Right, and so you put on these events. These are these events I are do. done by you. Yeah. Okay. No, so, so so that's I mean that's 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 key right there is putting on events like this. Now, how did you get started in the event side of things? How did that evolve? Sure, that was actually a very organic way. <laughs> it was not planned. I did not anticipate. In fact, being a television producer actually helps you with event producing, like, mm -hmm. tremendously. Um, we were going to South by Southwest, and I wanted to meet... I knew I was going to meet some tech people. I knew I was going to meet people in San Francisco, L.A., blah, 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 whatever. But I really wanted to meet the Austin food community, because I thought, of all the people that are going to be there in town, those are the people who are interesting me more because not only can I tell them about Bake Space, but I can also um, build relationships with them. And so I thought, shoot, if, if I'm going to invite them to a party, get them drunk, they won't even remember me. <laughs> so I was like, forget that, and alcohol is so expensive. I was like, oh, this is ridiculous. So then I realized that a lot of friends who were um, coming into town to speak at South by Southwest, uh, we try to do our conferences when other conferences are happening. While they don't take from those conferences because we're not taking the hotels and it's not a destination conference, um, we can tap into the speakers that are really talented. And usually they're talking on different topics than they would anyway. Um, and it, the uh, community that goes there are local people, which usually don't go to the conferences that are, that are happening. So it's a really good fit for us. Um, but like Ben Ha from I Can't Have Cheeseburger, we had Robert Scoble. Um, Brian Solis, uh, Sarah Evans. I mean, we've had like top of the line speakers, and so we. I invited these tech people because I thought if the food bloggers realize that if they look at their website or their community as a technology as well, that they'll be able to um, build it quicker, build it faster, build it better. That all that hard work that they're doing, especially with food bloggers, it, it takes a lot. They have to get the ingredients, they have to cook, they have to take pictures, they have to tweet about it, they have to pick their picture, they have to edit their picture, blah, 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 whatever. Um, and they have to cook it and then they have to eat it. <laughs> so it like, takes a lot, the process. And so I thought, well, let me, let, me, let me get these tech people to come in and talk to the food bloggers. And it was a really organic space. We did it in a restaurant. Everyone was just sitting on chairs. Uh, it was super intimate. And I was like, wow, I think this is, there is something here. Like, there is, like, a, a vibe. And that the speakers were so excited because the audience was, they were not the jaded social media people who were like, oh, I've already heard all this stuff before, you know, or, oh, I, I already have that, or they're on their Blackberries or their, their iPhones, like, you know, doing all this stuff. And so um, I think because they were so excited, the, the speakers were like, oh, my God, I love this. Um, and then New York, the, Michelle from Cupcakes Take the Cake, like a month and a half later was like, we need to do uh, Tech Munch in New York. And I was like, let's do it. And usually we're the only conference that comes to a community when, you, when they ask for it. So if somebody says, I have the community, they want you here, we will make sure it happens in that city. We did Minneapolis. We did Tampa that way. We worked with Jeff Hope, the Tampa Tribune food editor. I mean, it's just, that's how it evolved. And so it's, it's a very organic conference. Like the... The year is not planned out in advance. Usually I don't know where we're doing a conference. Like today, we're, we were invited to Vegas. And I was like, you know what? I think that'd be great. Vegas tech community is really happening. Let's go. So that's kind of that's how we build our, our conference. It's more about Absolutely. the people. That's, so it sounds like you've had a lot, of, a lot of help, obviously, from a lot of... I mean, it's, it's funny. You mentioned Robert Scoble. And <laughs> well, uh, I, I still have uh, the uh, message saved from when he first put me in his circles on Google+. Plus. I, oh. I, I took a screenshot and I saved it. It was a very special day in my life. <laughs> you know, I think he got overwhelmed when people invited him to stuff or something. I heard something like he was like, what's going on? Why am I getting all these invites? <laughs> That's funny. So I, I decided not to follow him just for that reason. I was like, I don't want to be in the vault. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. So... So, so building this, so, so it, it happened organically. It just kind of followed naturally to build these events. Um, 
What do you say to somebody who is, again, you know, brand new at this, just starting out, if they want to build events, they may not have all the connections and, you know, the ability to put something together like that. How should they go about building? And, and just so you have context, let's, let's use an example. But you know what? In fact, let's, let's be very specific. Let's say I'm, I'm, I'm a mommy. I'm passionate about baking cupcakes. And obviously, you know, somebody like that should be following what you're doing closely. Um, so I guess that's probably the first piece of advice is find people who are doing what you want to do and follow them closely, learn from them, right? Yeah. But yeah. Uh, take it from there. What, what, how do you go beyond that with, with somebody who's trying to get started out and build something maybe like what you've done? Sure. Um, I think for conferences, you should start really small. You should find a co-working space, like some space that is going to offer or donate the space for free. Lots of restaurants will donate a space if you're going to feed people or the bar is going to be open. So don't limit yourself by it has to be in a conference setting and it has to be all formal. You can start off with just some mixers where you are, there's a great guy in LA named um, Kevin Winston who does Digital LA, that's his um, Twitter handle. He produces an event, seriously, every day. He's in London right now producing events for Digital LA during the Olympics. I mean, he does a panel almost once a week. He started with just a mixer, like just getting people together and he started building his database and his email newsletters so that he would have the people he could reach out to once an event came. And I think that's really the key is building a database of people that once you're ready to actually start producing those events that you can get people to actually come. Because people will, if they're having a good time, they will keep coming to your events. Uh, Kevin is a great example in starting small and just then, he just did the um, Silicon Beach Fest that's what they call us here in LA, which I hate. I hate that term. <laughs> I'm like, oh, great. It's not bad. It's a, we, I can think of worse. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, but when you live in Hollywood, you're like, you know, you're like, there's no beach here. <laughs> yeah, that's true. People won't go past the 405. That's true. But, it's, but, but that, let's face it, that's what people think of when they yeah. think of us Californians. Is they, yeah. they think we all live on the beach and surf every day and go yeah. sailing, and they don't think we actually do any work around here. No, um, they don't. <laughs> So, you know, let's talk about the future now, right? I mean, you get to a point, you've built a community, you've, you've got things going. Do you, do you find that you ever think, okay, what's next? Or how do you find inspiration to keep going and keep coming up with new ideas and, and just take everything that you've built up so far and figure out where you're going next? You know, what's the future look yeah. like for you? Well, you know, technology is... is, is um it's kind of, it's interesting because you can think of an idea and it can be done or it can be done better or whatever is the situation and you almost have to you have to almost think like three steps ahead of where the technology is going because it will be outdated by the time you build it so you if you're going to build just a technology company um, I think you have to be very quick and you have to flip that uh, fairly quickly. If that's not a community, if you're, if you're like I'm, I built a community. Facebook came in and took over every single sort of like social engagement in the universe. So how do you now make a community of home cooks valuable to a brand or valuable to anyone, a media company? Um, and that's when we started with our self-publishing platform. So now I have the ability to look at my members as not just people who are using the site, but also consumers. How can I get them to buy stuff as well? So we, cookbooks are a great opportunity because people like recipes, people usually like cookbooks. So I think if you build a strong foundation and you can then look at your, um, how can you parlay that into other opportunities, but make sure that they, I always say it's kind of like uh, spiral marketing. It's like our community promotes you know, our cookbook publishing, our cookbook publishing is attracted by food bloggers. Food bloggers want to come to our conferences. If you can kind of build something that's going in the same direction, even if there are different parts to it, um, you can build upon it, uh, I think is really the key, as opposed to a lot of people, when they start something, um, God, there's a term for it, and I cannot remember it now, someone wrote a great article about it, where when you're thinking of a new idea, it's like it's it's, your optimism is so high because you haven't been able to figure out all the bad things that are, are wrong with the idea. So you go from idea to idea to idea until you figure out, oh, that doesn't work. But if you start off with a strong foundation where you're building community, everything from then on uh, is pretty much good because you will always be able to go back to that community to either 
drive traffic, to share contests, to uh, sell products. Without the community, none of that stuff, no matter what you think of, really doesn't really matter. Right. And are you using Facebook at all? Like, like Facebook, I, I know a lot of people, yeah. it almost seems like this is kind of the, uh, the, the trend right now, is you build a community, and you, but, but one of the ways to go out and, and kind of create that sort of pond that you're going to draw from to build your community on your local property is to create like a Facebook group. Right, I think groups are much more engaging than fan pages. That's what I've seen anyway, because I think it's, yeah, it's more of a level playing field. It feels more like a level playing field. It's not so much one way. Yeah. You know, where a fan page, I think, is more of a broadcasting tool. Here's my message. Go, you know, you, sure you can comment on it and like on it and like it, but the groups, I think, are more conducive to you know ongoing communication and threads and all that. So you're right. using that kind of. Are you well, using you know, them? what's interesting about groups is that groups emails you. So now if I had a group, I am getting into someone's inbox as well by being able to send them the updates. And once I realized that, I was like, oh, man, why didn't I make a group? <laughs> I'm like, instead of a fan page. <laughs> Well, unless you're like me, where I have rules set up that say take all the Facebook messages and yeah, stick yeah, them in this yeah, folder, yeah. and I might look at them. You know, that's true. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have a folder called "Mail I Don't Care About," yeah. and basically, it just it just moves everything into there. Um, right. Uh, no, we use our Facebook fan page uh, for lots of different reasons. Uh, one is I really love the new promoted posts, so you can pay to make sure. Which is, you know, I hate it because it seems wrong on so many levels, like they control the algorithm and then want to charge me to be able to have people who opted into my page see my posts, which makes me very mad. But I love the ability to be able to control that with the dollar and be able to make sure more people see it. Um, I like that. I like, uh, we, we've been doing a whole bunch of uh, photo uh, testing of like we'll write something on a photo and get people to guess what it is or whatever. That's been really successful the last couple of weeks. Uh, our, our Facebook fan page is just Bakespace, uh, facebook.com slash Bakespace. Um, and you can kind of see what we've been doing. Uh, that's been really successful. We just recently had something that got like 300 and something likes on one post, which was weird because it's a picture of onion rings. And that's all it says is, do you like onion rings? And I'm like, I have thought about posts and just racked my brain, and that one gets 300 and something likes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, There's no rhyme or reason. <laughs> I, I don't know if you happen to catch it, but a, a, a couple weeks ago I had my friend Scott Carey on here, and he told a story about how he built a community around cheese and the way it started was he had just broken up with a girl, and so he was feeling down, and he, um, you know, he, and he started eating cheese. And he posted a comment on Facebook saying, you know what, I love cheese. And all of a sudden, all these people started chiming in saying, I love yeah. cheese too. And he pretty soon created the International Cheese Lovers Association on Facebook as a group and then started getting advertisers coming in, Cabot Cheese and these other companies. I actually should put you in touch with him. I think it kind of oh died my God. off. But yeah. he would be a great person for you to speak with, I think, because he <laughs> is great at that kind of stuff. <laughs> and I think you're right. There's no rhyme or reason. I, yeah. it's, it, in my experience, I think it's, it's sometimes the stupidest things that I post that get the most attention. You know, yeah. Or yeah, the simplest. No, I agree. Uh, you know, it's actually the simplest. I talked to a guy who was like, he's like, the best ads on Facebook are, like us if you like blank. I'm like, what? He's like, he's like, that's exactly how we built our million user base. I mean, they have a million fans. And he's like, make the simplest ad ever. Like, just say, like us. Like, tell people what to do. I'm like, are you serious? Are people that dumb? He's like, yes, please just do that. And I did that, and it was like, it grew exponentially. I, we probably got like two or 3,000 fans by just changing an ad like that. It was a yep. little, little ridiculous. One of my most retweeted tweets, which I have syndicated now, it goes off periodically, is something I put out there because I saw somebody complaining about QuickBooks. Yeah. And it's, they said something about being angry. And so I posted a tweet in reply to theirs saying, I'm great at making people less angry when it comes to QuickBooks. And that That's got great. retweeted like crazy. And now actually I'm getting it printed on a T-shirt, and I'm going to give that T-shirt away when I go to speak at conferences now. Um, That's a great idea. That's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, because I, I noticed that you could click, you know, on a tweet and see the yeah. individual tweet, and it just hit me like, that would make a great t-shirt. You yeah. know, just give it away to promote. So before I, because we're, we're, we've got about 15 minutes left, I, it doesn't look like we have any questions from what I've seen, Bruce. Do, you, do we have any? 
No, no, we're not. We're questionless. We do have some comments, which I'll get to. I noticed on YouTube, so we'll yes. we'll take a look at that. I want to read the comments and get your response. You know, because sure. uh, we've got what looks like some good feedback. But first, I Hopefully need to they're know. they're good. <laughs> no, yeah, they are. They are. Um, but first, I need to know. Um, favorite kind of cupcake. Mm. I make a chocolate cupcake with a chocolate ganache center and a ganache topping that is to die for. It is so delicious. Um, it is definitely my, let me see if I can post the recipe on here. I'll, I'll put it. I'll link give it. us the link and then Bruce can repost it everywhere. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's my, this is by far my favorite recipe ever. Okay, and is this one of your own or is this one that somebody yeah. from your community made? Okay. No, this is, this is one that I made. This is one that I made. I love baking. You do? Yes. I make my own extract. Really? Yes. That is impressive. It's, I don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, now that you mention it, maybe you guys need to talk also after this. Okay, I, I, found, the, I found the recipe. I found the recipe, and it's delicious. This is like my, and it's going to be embarrassing when you see the recipe because you're going to be so disgusted when you see the the word mayonnaise in it. But it will make the the um the cake. In a cupcake, that does sound yeah. weird. I'll admit. Yeah, it's it's disgusting. I mean, it, it sounds really bad. But like it a, is a tuna so filled good. cupcake. Oh, look at my, eyes. <laughs> my my face froze on with me going, ugh. <laughs> there you go. 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 This is by far my favorite recipe ever. All right, Bruce, you got that? Yeah. So and then um as far as recipes in your community go, is there any one particular recipe that you can talk about, like submitted by one of your uh, community members that's like that stands out above the rest or any particular ones that stand out that people should know about? Oh man, how do I even start? Um, we have a woman, actually, we have a woman named Danielle named I'm Stuffed uh, is her nickname and she's in Burbank. She, we're supposed to meet for cupcakes oh, again. Oh, no way. <laughs> yeah, she's in Burbank. Um, she's really great. She does a lot of stuff. Uh, uh, there's a woman named, actually a great story, um, there's a woman named Kathy, and she lives in uh, Minnesota, and she became a finalist on the Pillsbury Bake Off, which she tapped into the community for the topping for her recipe to actually go into the, um, it's like a million dollar prize, and there's like a hundred people that are picked. And she had talked to another member, Shane, who gave her the idea for what the topping would be, and the nut that she should use. And uh, I was, was invited to the Pillsbury Bake Off as media, and I got to be next to her when she cooked her recipe, which was really like one of the highlights of probably working on the side is just being able to like be there with a member cooking a recipe that you know she got some inspiration for uh, you know from the, the community. Um, and then I was able to kind of talk to her and say, you know, don't make the third recipe. Just go around and experience the day because like this will never happen again. You want to be around the people. It's kind of like a wedding day where it just goes so fast. It just she won't remember it. Um, and it was just such a joy. She's such a wonderful, wonderful person. That's great. And, and you know, I, I, I can't help but uh, but ask this question because I'm, I'm just uh, I'm just curious. Um, and now it escapes me. As I'm talking, I'm completely losing my mind on the question I was going to ask. Um, I'll have to come back to that. Um, let's go to the comments, and then we'll come back, and my brain will reorganize itself. Literally, as I was saying it to you, it just completely escaped my mind. So. Um, our friend Rhonda Bergen on YouTube comments, she writes, oh my gosh, I'm loving her site. I'm hoping to share some good stuff. I post a recipe a day on my social media. This could work out great. And then I just remembered what I was going to ask you next. Um, but anything on that? Any suggestions for her? Where she should go? And if she wants to get a daily recipe to like rebroadcast to her followers? I think what she should do is that when she posts her recipes on Bakespace to include my Twitter handle, at Bakespace and send me the message so that I will retweet that for her through all my Twitter followers. Um, that's my job is to promote all of our members' content. So uh, just t let that's actually across the board advice for anyone. If you're reading an article or you're seeing something on a website, just take five minutes, look for the for the reporter's Twitter handle because usually you know they don't get much credit for a lot of the stuff that they promote because it'll be. You know, in the pre-made Twitter, it'll just be, you know, probably the newspaper's hash, you know, username. If you find the reporter, they will actually, like, retweet that stuff and say thank you and engage. And then now you have a great media contact. So that's how to do that. 
and I will right. retweet that. No, that's how I've gotten a lot of help with building my own social presence on the web is by frankly retweeting and engaging with people who had a big following. And, you know, at a certain point, I, I got Chris Perlow's attention, and he and I started emailing. We published a couple of e-books together, you know. Oh, so awesome. you never know where that's going to come from. Okay. But I think I agree with you. If you want to, if you, if you have an interest in something, and, you know, let's face it, your following is not small. I, I, I was just looking at the beginning of the interview, and it's north of 120,000 people. That's a lot of followers oh, on Twitter. <laughs> um, okay, so bef so yeah, if you if you have an interest in connecting with somebody on, on in social media, a really good way to do that is to flatter them by rebroadcasting their content and making sure that they see you do that. And then most likely they'll be flattered and they will want to help you any way they can. That's kind of that's why it's social, right? I yeah. help you, you help me, but the first. Uh, uh, you know, the first priority, for lack of a better word, should be to go out there and help other people, and then eventually people are going to help you. Now, question. The, is this just an L.A. thing, or is, 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 is this cupcake trend, like, going on all over the country or all over the world? What's the story with this cupcake trend? I mean, we had <laughs> sprinkles, and, you know, every time I turn around, there's another cupcake place opening up on another street here in Burbank. What's the story? Actually, uh, the original idea for Bake Space was a cupcake shop, um, and I tried to rent out a space, and they, they, they rented it out, and I just decided not to do a, a, a shop anymore. One day when I retire, I will have a cupcake shop. Um, I think cupcakes will never go out of style. I mean, Sprinkles has a, an ice cream parlor now, um, but cupcakes are something that it's, they're so decadent that you can enjoy on your own. We are not going to give that up. I'll get that. Hello, phone. Hello, phone. Hello, phone. There you go. Um, look, at, that was good timing. <laughs> it's like someone being like, hello. Um, no, I think they're so decadent, they're so adorable, and they're so personalized and pint-sized, and you can get your own flavor. You cannot do that with a pie. You cannot do that with, you know, marshmallows. You cannot do that with, ch I mean, you sure, chocolate, but one piece of chocolate is not going to satisfy you. Um, so I just think that uh, that cupcakes are something, I mean, we're, we're, we're bred that way as children. You know, you bring cupcakes to birthday parties. They're easy to clean up. Um, you can eat four of them, and, you'll, and you will only feel like you had this much. <laughs> right, right. Eat a whole cake on your own. And what about uh, cupcakes for people who are trying to watch their waste? Yeah. What do, you, do you have anything like that on your site, like, you know, low-fat cupcakes? You know, we do. We do have a ton. We have uh, about 60,000 recipes that have been submitted by members. We have um, everything from gluten-free to uh, fat-free to, um, I don't know, I mean, carob, whatever it is that you, uh, you can either search by ingredient or you can actually go to that category. Um, there's a healthy, let's see, what do I have as my categories here? Light and health, there's a light and healthy section as well. Um, I'll just read you a couple of the categories. Uh, diabetic, egg-free, gluten-free, high calcium, high fiber, high protein, kosher. I mean, you know, you, 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 if, if, if it's important to you, and if the category is down on the site, we usually add the category. Um, members have asked us to do that a lot. And then the recipes come flooding in because they see the Eggs. category and it gives them the idea. Yeah, exactly. If you want that type of recipe, upload it. Be, be, be part of the community that kind of drives where the community is going. And pe right. people will follow. I love that. Cupcakes, uh, cupcakes for anybody, pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> like the whole chicken soup for the soul series. We have to think of a comparable cupcake thing. Like <laughs> cupcake for dog lovers or something. I don't know. Well, now um, you're making me hungry. <laughs> well, cupcakes do that. Cupcakes, but you're right. It's, it's so simple. It's like Bruce posted in the chat here. It's like a single user cake. Yes. You know, it's just one use. Um, the problem is, can you have just one? And you know, then there's the whole loaf. If you're like me, you like to eat, and I don't like to stop at just one. I'm not, I'm not a one cupcake kind of guy. Um, another question, and this just come, kind of goes into the topic that we were talking about before about simplicity and some of the simplest things being sometimes the most uh, uh, viral, so to speak. I am going to take a wild guess and say that, because I mean, your site is about all kinds of recipes for all kinds of things now, right? Yeah. Or is it all strictly baked? Is it only no. about baked goods? Okay. So um, popular lemonade recipes on there? Yeah. Oh, there's a ton. Yeah, you know, we have a ton of beverages. 
I bring that up because I, a while back, did a, I wanted to do a, a demonstration of how to use QuickBooks for a complex inventory system where you're taking the ingredients and mixing them together and you've got to buy the ingredients in one denomination and then use it and then prepare oh the God. product. <laughs> and so it was, uh, it was, um, I, I, it was uh, turning lemons into lemonade. That was the name yeah. of the post that I did. It was a blog post, and I got a lot of uh, popularity. Um, and then people started coming at me with lemonade recipes, and I never f quite figured out what to do with them in the context of what I was doing, but listening to you, I, I know you have ideas. <laughs> you need to make a cookbook with the lemonade recipes, and you, then you can also, on, on each recipe, you can actually have like a, a video or a tip or anything that you put that you can apply it to what you actually do. Um, I think that's a great idea. I think that I think each recipe should have a tip for for working with them, and then uh, then the actual recipe. I think people would love that. That'd be great. You know, maybe a digital cookbook where mm -hmm. you you get the cookbooks tutorial and you get all the recipes. So if you want to start your own lemonade stand, I mean, and, oh, you know what? This brings up an interesting point actually. And I know we're running short on time here, but yeah, I'm I'm surprised I just thought of this now. Kind of popped into my head. Um, do you do you or does anyone you know are you you your whole site is based on recipes? You're not actually selling the actual food, are you? No, no, we don't. We don't. Okay, do that. not yet. Are you do you have any experience with your exposure to the dynamics of trying to sell food, especially online? I would think there'd be all kinds of implications with respect to health codes and all this. What do you, what can you tell us about that? You know, uh, it's very difficult to to sell like in the real world where you have to have a kitchen that has certain. Um, there, I mean, there's, there's all these rules to what the kitchen is. Oh, I'm glad it's your dog, not mine. <laughs> yeah, that's mine. Um, there's so many rules. I mean, one of the reasons why I actually started the cookbook uh, uh, platform was I, I was mentoring a woman who had a thousand orders for gift baskets that she was going to make these cookies that were like her famous um, oatmeal bars, and she couldn't buy the buy the items, she couldn't mass produce them, and she couldn't package them. Uh, quickly enough to be able to actually process the orders. Now, a thousand orders for her would have changed her life. She would have been able to do this full time. It was amazing. She had to basically turn all those orders away. So I think the those rules and regulations in the kitchen, um, the people who are selling stuff online usually um, are already following those rules. Um, I don't know enough about that to be able to say, I mean, we've tried to stay away from that a little bit. Uh, I mean, it, I, obviously, you know, in the cookbooks, it'd be, you know, we're, we're going towards, like, coupons and stuff like that. So the idea is actually getting people to go out there, and if they see a, a berry cookbook, that they'll go out and actually buy the berries because they want to make the recipe in it. Um, but uh, to, in order that they'll do that at the grocery store. We won't uh, – you should contact um, – is Foodsy still called Foodsy? I can, I can probably put you in contact with some folks who actually do that. They actually have websites and they have um, monthly uh, ordering services that you can order food and it comes to you per month. I think there's Love With Food, which is a San Francisco startup. Um, there's a whole bunch that are going in that direction. They, they would know how to answer that question. Right. Yeah, because I'm always, as, as somebody who deals with a lot of different businesses, I'm frequently asked by people, you know, yeah. what do you know about setting up a business? A lot of people would love to have a business online where they're baking stuff in their kitchen and selling it online. And up until now, I've said, uh, stay away. I certainly can't advise you on it because yeah. it's, it just seems like there's so much potential for problems. Um, I, from the accounting standpoint, I just think of the insurance that it would probably be through the roof. <laughs> That's what I was thinking too. I mean, the, the the idea that somebody gets sick and it's your fault and they can trace it back to you, yes. you know, I, I someone should not lose their home because of a bad marshmallow set. You know, <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Okay, so we we got literally less than two minutes left. So I want to just open it up to you, Babette. Just uh, you know. Promote away. Tell us where to find you, what you recommend sure. we do, what you've got going on that you want people to know about and get involved with. Sure. I think our biggest thing is um, obviously our Tech Munch conference. Our next one is happening in um, Philadelphia, which we're really excited on October 13th. That's October uh, 13th. With um, We have folks from Google Plus who are going to be speaking about the platform. Uh, we have some amazing food editors. We have some awesome brands, publicists, we're going to be talking about working with brands. Uh, so that website is techmunchpa.com. Usually all of the venues that we do, the URL will be techmunchplusthestate.com. So if 
TechMunch NY. Uh, you know, you can kind of figure it out uh, with, with each of the cities we go to, and they also cross-link to each other. Um, I'm also on Twitter, at Bakespace is my username. Uh, you can find me at bakespace.com, of course. And uh, the biggest thing is we're promoting our, our cookbook publishing platform that enables anyone to create a, a community cookbook. Uh, we just launched group cookbooks. So say you have a really passionate community and you want to inspire them to help you write this cookbook, you can just put out a link on Twitter and Facebook, especially for like family reunions. They're really fun. And people can help you by uploading recipes to your cookbook, which is really fun. Um, there's also the app portion of the cookbook uh, publishing platform. Uh, it's three components. It's, um, it's a cookbook builder, it's a cookbook storefront where you can buy cookbooks, lots of them are free, and it's also a reader. So once you download those cookbooks, the biggest problem for cookbook authors is discoverability. Well, the way that we, uh, the way that we index all of our recipes in a cookbook makes it really searchable so that cookbook authors um, get front and center. They don't once, you know, if your cookbook doesn't make it to the bestsellers list, like you're, you're out of there, um, which is really exciting for us. So you can find out about, uh, if you just go into the iTunes App Store, it's on iPad. Uh, it's Cookbook Cafe, or you can search Bake Space. What else do I can tell you? Um, I'm really excited about being here today. I appreciate the opportunity. No, I appreciate you coming here. And actually, you know what, I don't care. I'm going to go over for a couple minutes because another, I think, very important question, or maybe it's more of a comment, uh, just occurred to me, which is the following. I mean, a lot of people flock, you have the whole network on TV, the food network, where you're pretty much, you can spend 24 hours a day watching people make all different kinds of food. It seems to me, and I'm wondering what you think about this, or I'm, sure, I'm going to guess you probably already thought of it, but it seems to me something like this, Google Plus Hangouts, is a great opportunity for somebody to do their own show in their own kitchen online. I mean, is that going on? I haven't, I'm not in that world enough to know. Well, Actually, <laughs> we are going to be doing uh, a weekly Google Hangout with Jeff Hoke, the food editor of the Tampa Tribune, and um, Renee Lynch. She is the one of the food editors at LA Times. Uh, we're going to be doing a monthly, not a monthly, a weekly chat where we find an ingredient, we talk about it, and there's a few other. I'm not, I'm not able to. I'm not able to reveal the secret, but there's I something that's really cool we're doing um, that is going to completely just blow people's minds uh, with each of the chats. Okay, so, so the bottom line excited. is you have to follow Babette <laughs> yeah. on Twitter and Facebook yeah. everywhere to find out yeah. what she's got going on because it's going to be some pretty cool stuff. And yeah, let's face it, who doesn't love food? <laughs> that's true. That is very true. It's and usually great. I post some good stuff. So I'm excited. I'm excited to have you here. Thank you so much for coming out. Uh, Thanks. Bruce, any last-minute uh, questions or comments from people? Uh, one person asked, uh, I, I assume it's the same, because you said pretty much every area is covered, but I, so I assume there's sugar-free recipes on there, too? Yes, yes. That was definitely. on here on... Uh, yeah, diabetic recipes, too. Okay, cool. And somebody hey. says hi from Brazil. Hi, hi. <laughs> Hello, Brazil. And now you're world you. famous. <laughs> now you're world famous, that's right, just like Nerd Enterprises. Awesome. All right, well, Thank you so much, Babette, and I definitely want to talk to you more after this because I, I, I think there's some more stuff we can do together, and I, I think you should talk to Bruce. Yeah. You need my cheese friend, and I you need my, uh, my lemonade recipes, and then Bruce needs to talk to you about his home extract business because maybe you could help him <laughs> get that out there. So anyway. <laughs> this could be a good you. cookbook too. All right. All right. Thank you Thanks, so man. much for being with me. Bye, guys. <laughs>